Yuka Nagashima, the CEO of the High Tech Development Corporation. Thanks so much for coming down. Thanks for having me. So let's uh, let's catch up. You know, I mean, the last time you and I were together in, in a forum like this, it was on the radio. Remember, from several years ago. <laughs> Absolutely, it was a long time ago. And uh, boy, what an experience you've had uh, over the past few years with the High Tech Development Corporation. But I want to start off with your th with your, um, your your events. You've got a couple of events you're involved in right now, yes. and they will help everybody understand where you are these days. Right. So one of the reasons that High Tech Development Corporation is trying to um, diversify Hawaii's economy. I mean, I think the reason is very clear right now. Um, tourism alone isn't going to carry our economy, and so we're trying to do all we can to help our companies locally. Of course, the state does not have enough funding, so then the strategy will be to leverage the federal funding and the federal programs. So one of the ways we do that is through a program called the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Uh, the SBIR program, for short, um, is a federal program that um, Hawaii, State of Hawaii has a matching program for. So we do assistance in a couple of ways. Um, this is a grant program from the federal government that we will help, HCDC will help the local companies uh, vet their applications to make sure their applications are well written and that they will have good chances of winning. Um, we, another way to help is, uh, that the state is helping, is that we will fund the companies who won the Phase 1 award of SBIR to help them get to the Phase 2 award, which is much larger in um, money amounts. So this thing about consulting with somebody who's building an application, something relatively new. This is going to help the, um, the young entrepreneur, the entrepreneur who hasn't been through the process before, That's give them right. a greater likelihood of success. Right, and this federal program is very important because there are 11 agencies of the federal government all asking for help from small businesses to solve their problems. And so this is a great way for Hawaii tech companies and innovation companies, not just tech actually. There are some farming companies who won the award from USDA, for example, that's Department of Agriculture of the US government. And um, they've been able to great make great strengths, uh, strides to their, their companies and their business. And the great thing about this program is that the intellectual property remains with the company. So they can commercialize the product after they have been able to you know, provide the, the um, concept to the, the government. So what we are doing is through this Hawaii uh, SBIR conference that's coming up in November, mid-November, um, we are inviting all the federal managers responsible for the SBIR program in different federal agencies and talking to the tech companies directly. So, you know, Hawaii tech companies have a hard time getting to the mainland and we all don't have money all the time and it's a long travel. So for us to be able to get all these federal government folks all in one place at the same time, it's a priceless uh, experience and we're only charging a reasonable amount. We're not really making money at it at all. We're actually losing money by putting this conference, but I know this is great economic development that we're doing. So um, the dates are, it's statewide. So on Oahu, it's November 16th. And of course, the information is on our website at www.hcdc.org. So we <coughs> encourage any companies who have not applied before, have not considered federal grants, uh, especially the SBIR grant, to take a look on the website, see if that's uh, something that you want to get into. Again, reasonable registration. And this also, the entrance to this conference also involves, uh, includes um, one day workshop, a training day on Friday, again on Oahu. Um, and that's hopefully ThinkTech could capture that as well. And um, that would include not only how better to manage your intellectual property, um, but also how to manage the contract once you win it, because that's one uh, expertise that you can't usually just go to the university and learn about. So that's some, you know, a job, um, job training that, that we all need to do, and uh, it's pretty specialized training that you can get elsewhere, and it's included in the price of the registration. So. Of course we'll help you. We'll be there, okay? Great. <laughs> I want to talk about SBIR in general for a minute, you know, to sort of to put it in perspective. So if I apply for and successfully obtain an SBIR grant, mm -hmm. well, how much money am I going to get and what can I do with it? Sure. So phase, there are a couple of phases. Phase one 
is when you get the amount of money for about $100,000. It depends on the award. It depends on the agency that's offering it. Um, so that's not enough to really do much, but it's enough to get you started to uh, flesh out a concept. And nobody usually pays you money to flesh out a concept, but this is where you can't really ask for venture capital. You can't really ask for angels. Banks surely are going, not going to lend you money for that. So that's where the role of government is, sort of bridging that gap. Well, it's very important in Hawaii. And I would like to take a moment to segue off that to talk about entrepreneurship, how uh, the Manoa Innovation Center and HTDC uh, cultivate that and, and, and sort of nurture it, mm -hmm. and how the uh, SBIR program plays into it. Sure. Um, so before I, I forget, the Phase 2 award um, is uh, for people who win the Phase 1 award who have demonstrated great um, effectiveness and looks like they could show some prototypes are allowed to go on to Phase 2 program, which is $750,000 uh, or more, again, depending on different agencies. So that's a substantial money. That's where real economic development can start to take place, where you can hire your um, expert, um, uh, start getting relationships with the university professors as an expert, um, hiring students, hiring people, buying equipment to get things done. So those are very important things that would contribute to the, the Hawaii's uh, tech infrastructure. I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's the big money. That, that is the big money, and it's very competitive. Again, you know, it's vetted by the federal government. Um, so, you know, but it's worth a try because, again, that $750,000, that's a lot of money. And, of course, that's not the end all. The difference between SBI and a lot of other federal programs is that they really want you to commercialize. That's why they give you the intellectual property to keep. So. What we need to do is when the government asks you to find out if uh, maybe a soldier can have better health by having some sort of health device in the battlefield, um, if you could use that to then uh, improve the quality of health care in remote parts of the island, you know, that would be a great way to commercialize that same intellectual property. And that could result not only in economic development by selling those devices all over the world, but of course to help the community with that innovation. So it's really a win-win, and we hope more entrepreneurs will learn about this and take advantage of this program. Now, that's a dual-use concept. That's the right. The government has the benefit, but you also retain the benefit yourself. Absolutely, right. Win-win. Win-win. Yeah, that's great. So <clears throat> uh, it's uh, just a thought, but uh, you know, we're in a recession. We have uh, financial, fiscal trouble in Washington, and for that matter, in the state, certainly in the state. Um, how does that affect the SBIR program? Is, is, are the monies now limited because of that in some way? Um, actually, SBIR funding is mandated to be 2.5%, I believe, of that particular federal agency's budget. So it's something that's mandated by Congress. And so obviously the percentage, the actual amount would change if that uh, particular um, agency has declined in its budget. Um, but at least that percentage is reserved. And so, uh, so that's good. And of course, the competition might get tougher because states mm. are no longer able to provide some of the benefits. And so they're looking more towards federal programs. And so it sounds right. like maybe there would be a cut simply because the, the percentage remains constant, but the, the gross on which the percentage is extended may be, may be diminishing. Yes. yes. And of course, the state funding um, is cut. So our SBIR matching fund from the state is cut. Um, we do our best to keep that amount, though. Um, so we, ACDC has cut other expenses to preserve that as much as possible because we believe that that is direct investment to the companies, um, and that's so important. And I, I realize that the government needs to right-size itself in this time, um, but at the same time, cutting and cutting doesn't get us to the future. To get out of our hole, we have to invest. So yeah, we I want to explore that, that with you. Yeah, we believe that this is part of the invest investment. I'm glad you believe it, but we want everybody to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> so can we go back to the notion of uh, what does this sort of program do? You know, in some cases, it may not be enough to cover the whole project. You know, in some cases, it's, it's relatively token or nominal. Uh, but what, you know, what do you hope to achieve in terms of the, um, the reaction of the entrepreneur? What are we building here? Aside from companies, we're building people. So what do we, what's the process of building the entrepreneur? 
You know, a lot of people talk about is the entrepreneur bred, you know, are they born that way or do we breed them that way? Do we nurture them that way? Do they become entrepreneurs? I think there are a lot of, I think we have an entrepreneurship in all of us. Um, and I think sometimes it's discouraged. And I think in, in many cases it is, it is taking risk. Um, in other parts, I think it's for some people, it's not as big as all the other passions that they might have. Um, so of course we can't change people who, for who they are, but HCDC and, and others, our sister agencies and the partners that we work with in economic development, we look for people who are wanting to explore their entrepreneurship and you know, get out of their way, number one, you know, help them remove some of the obstacles, whether it's red tape from the government, permitting, whatnot, um, to providing them with the tools that's harder to come by in Hawaii just because we're a little bit remote. And despite the technology, and I think technology can help a lot, but despite that, sometimes it's just a human relationship that we need to build with entrepreneurs and uh, business community, venture capitalists, and uh, just a culture to be exposed to from Silicon Valley or um, the Life Sciences Corridor back east. So, so we need to really have that kind of information not only brought back to Hawaii, but I want to encourage the Hawaii entrepreneurs to get out there. I think our community has been very sort of sedentary. I think we tend to be a very warm but passive culture where we're very used to hosting other people. Welcome, you know, we're this tourist industry. We're very used to, to doing that, but um, we barely, we rarely um, in these days um, venture out to just figure out what's out there. And I think it's important for us to keep, you know, being curious what's out there, despite the fact that we love this paradise uh, state. So uh, do you see, the, you see it unfold in front of you? You, you have this uh, SBIR program, and I'm sure you walk the halls of the Manoa Inter Innovation Center, and maybe you have a conversation, give some advice. You are the muse. You are the muse who encourages <laughs> these, these, I, I don't want to say kids, but entrepreneurs uh, to, to go to the next step, to keep at it, and so forth. So what, what kind of reaction, what kind of response, what do they like? What's the track for them? I consider myself not a muse, but maybe a cheerleader of sorts. Um, and maybe also WD-40, where you know, we just <laughs> s spray a little to make things go a little easier, because it is a lot of hard work. And uh, sometimes people need perspective. Sometimes people need, out boy, it's OK, or you'll get it the next time, or congratulations. Nobody was watching, but I was, you know, that kind of thing. Um, those interactions are probably the most gratifying uh, for me personally, and I know for my staff, to be able to really learn their pains and understand it, empathize, and, and figure it out with them. Most of the time, they do all the problem solving. So again, for me to be part of that um, is exciting and rewarding as well. Um, a lot of the economic development is long term and beyond any election cycle, beyond any administrative cycle. So um, it is hard for us to really feel like we're doing much uh, when we're working hard to establish a culture for entrepreneurship and, and small businesses. So one of the few ways that we can um, get this type of interaction is through the actual events that we host. One of them is the pitch competition that we're doing. Actually, as we speak, we're doing the semifinalist round today, actually. And um, they will be part of the Global Entrepreneurship Week at the same week as um, SBIR conference. Um, of course, that's also part of the Global Entrepreneurship Week. And it's great for us to be able to see those companies start from very uh, worried and timid and unsure of their business plan to being able to proudly present articulately um, what their passion is and what their business proposal is. And why you should also invest in my company, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's very rewarding. Yeah, to see them develop. So tell me about the function that's going on right now. Where is it? Who's participating? What are they, what are they, what's the brass ring? Right, <laughs> so um, again, the SBIR conference uh, that's happening. Um, more information at htdc.org slash SBIR. And um, that is proudly sponsored by Boeing. We appreciate their help. I know it's extremely hard during this day and age to be sponsors of uh, these types of specialized conference. So we really thank Boeing for that. Um, we also have uh, another uh, the, uh, 
event I was talking about for mm -hmm. the pitch competition, that's on the 17th, on Tuesday, November 17th. Coming right up. Coming right up. Um, and we have uh, First Hawaiian Bank hosting it. Um, but again, uh, the information could be found at hgdc.org. Um, we have another event that's coming up. This is a little bit later in December um, called uh, Tech Jobs Hawaii. And uh, I'm sorry, the Tech Jobs Hawaii is presenting the Holiday Science and, and Tech Fair. And that is right here. And this is to address the need that, you know, we have, people have mentioned that we have a lot of brain drain where smart people have gone off to college and don't come back. Well, the, the tech situation here has changed quite a bit. We've grown, and so we wanted to let those people know whether they are students on the mainland or um, they are Kama expats, you know, previously Kama Aina who wants to really come home. They have elderly parent, parents to take care of, and they're really uh, wanting to look at different opportunities in Hawaii, I want them to know that there are now tech jobs available. It's not the same as it was 10 years ago, and this is a great venue t for them to network. So. Boy, it sounds pretty active to me. So, gee, you've been in office now for what, mm, five years? Is no, it? three. Three. God, it feels longer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're not aging quickly or anything, Yuka. <laughs> but tell yeah. me, uh, you know, how has it been? What is it? What is it for you now? What's the sort of the um, the your expectation, your career plan, if you want to talk about it? Okay. Um, I think my I think people have wondered why go from entrepreneur to working for the state. It Indeed, seems like you were a, an entrepreneur for several years and formed a company in Lavinette, which I still do business with. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So, you know, I sold my interest in that and I wanted to do something of a bigger scope. And I think this job has allowed me to um, see, not just worry about my own company, my own entity, but, you know, what does it make sense for the whole community? And I think that's a really privileged position. I don't think too many people, except for you, um, have the time to really think about it and um, and that's your job so I appreciate that very much and on the other hand I think my friends have wondered if I could uh, stomach the, the amount of bureaucracy and whatnot and and I think the entrepreneurship attitude came in handy there where you know you see opportunities not obstacles and you just want to learn the, the rules so that you can win at the game and uh, those are things that you learn as entrepreneurs and um, sure you know it sounds ridiculous for me to file three pieces of paper just to do this one thing that doesn't cost any money but hey if that's what it takes I'm gonna do it and so I, I hope that uh, you know that that would carry me through in getting some of the things accomplished that I still want to do you know it's to me what I hear in all of that is that if you uh, that if you are an entrepreneur you learn focus. And if you get into government after being an entrepreneur, you need to have the training of being able to focus. Right. Because it's probably a little more difficult to keep that focus when you're in the government than when you're in private industry. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think focus and priorities. That's, that's yeah. very important. And there's so many problems that we need to fix that I feel um, my sort of scientific background has helped me how to frame the problems, not just let's start solving you know, problems because there's too many. We have to first figure out what solutions are we after for what reasons and not just start picking up some good idea that somebody mentioned and start working on that because really is that solving the problem, original problem we wanted to solve in the first place. So I think that's, that's an important part that, that, that we tend to miss when, when there's so many problems out there. Great challenge for you and I think you've met it well. Of course, it remains to be seen what's going to happen in the next administration. Yes. Because here you are, you know, in the government, um, and you'll go beyond, you know, beyond the change in administration. But do you have any expectations? Do you have any thoughts going forward about how things will be uh, when there's a new governor in town? There's been a lot of talk um, about who's going to be governor, who's going to be lieutenant governor, if that's going to be good for tech, bad for tech, good for innovation sectors, whatnot. Um, I tend to stay away from that debate because. To me, that's not my, my choice. Um, I'm going to play the cards I got, get dealt. Um, and uh, I've got so much work to do right now that <laughs> I don't have to go through this theoretical um, 
puzzle of you know something that I don't have any control in the solution so or outcome so um, not worried about it too much and uh, and I think good ideas need to um, go past administrations go past partisan politics um, and I'm hoping that I can defend those ideas well enough with data with facts um, and with passion so that it doesn't really matter who is going to be in the governor's seat. That's good. Be a credit to any administration, <laughs> Yuka. So uh, I wanted to get, you know, we, you, were, uh, you attended the uh, Rebuilding in 2010 program we had last Thursday. And I wanted to get from you your thoughts, um, you know, on the snapshot of how the tech industry is doing relative to expectations, how it has the track of it, at least in your time or, or through the entire Lingle administration. Uh, where are we now? How have we done? How would you uh, sort of characterize the, the current state of affairs in the tech industry? I was very pleased with what I heard overall in that Rebuild 2010 conference. And the reason for that is that there was a lot of self-reflection which did not occur as a group before. And I think that self-reflection consisted of us uh, understanding that perhaps we didn't do a good job ourselves with PR and um, and that we need to change that. I think tech cannot be a separate entity or a group or a concept that tourism very much needs technology to figure out the solution to renewable energy so that the jet fuel co cost is going to be controlled so that we will continue to have airplanes flying to Hawaii. I think it, it is very much a union issue because, again, those projects that require constructions for uh, in infrastructure improvement and technologies, that's going to involve the union workers. And it's going to involve the education system because we need to have all these educated workforce. Uh, to you know, uh, educated students to contribute to the workforce. So um, it, it isn't just tech companies. And I think we were, again, I don't think nobody ever meant to do it, but the end result was that we came across very sort of short-sighted and self-absorbed when really technology embraces a lot of the solutions that Hawaii needs. So I think that's what I got out of the conference, that we need to be more forward-looking, more encompassing and more integrated with the community and I hope we can do that in the next session. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So, uh, but going forward, you know, there is um, a vacuum created by the um, decline and ultimately the demise of 221. Um, and right now that vacuum is unfilled. I mean, there's really no initiative that has popped up yet. Maybe it will, but not mm -hmm. yet. Um, and what do you see going into the next session on this? I mean, everybody agrees that capital, you know, that's why the SBR our program, uh, mm -hmm. capital formation, you know, the notion of um, startups who need investment capital uh, is so important. And right now, we don't have a program. So how important is it in the next session? What do you think will happen? Realistically, given the state's budget situation, um, I know the legislators that I've been speaking with, including the speakers of Rebuild 2010, um, have mentioned that it's probably going to be very difficult to pass any large packages that would require out front cash. So I think we're going to have to be creative in that sense, uh, really be prioritizing what we want to get, and make it revenue neutral as possible, whether it is deferred tax credit, where, you know, if it, if it is a tax credit, that uh, recipients of the tax credit cannot cash in that tax credit for a couple of years until the economy gets better, um, which might be a win-win because not too many people have huge tax liabilities. Mm -hmm, uh, like in, these days. Right, so, so that might work. Um, so that's one way to creatively address the issue. Um, and I think we are ahead of last year in that we know we've sort of, at least most of us have embraced this reality. Whether we like it or not, this is what happened. And so um, thanks to the leadership of Senator Fukunaga and Representative Ward and Representative McKelvey and, and others, uh, we have already convened three times, I believe, um, with the state capitol, at the state capitol, discussing what specific solutions we can bring forward that involve 
the industry people. So not just the lobbyists, not just industry um, representatives um, from trade associations, and not just the venture capital community, but the actual companies who are producing you know, innovative ideas. Um, and they need to get involved, and they have. And I know how difficult it is for them to give up their time. And, and yet, if it, maybe perhaps if it weren't for this dire situation, both in Act 221 and um, the budget situation and the general economic crisis, perhaps they would not have made it a priority to take their time to speak up. So, you know, when there are lemons, make lemonade. And I think that's what <laughs> some of them have uh, and reprioritized uh, to make sure that they could present their two cents to the legislative session. So I think we're, you know, we're farther along than we were last year where I think there was no plan last year no. and we could we couldn't get people to speak anything beyond capital formation. But now I feel like there's going to be, we have an agreement that capital formation alone, or particularly tax credits alone, isn't going to do it because even Act 2 to 1 would not have, I mean, it was optimized for seed funding um, and it wasn't optimized for follow on funding. It would have been too pricey for that anyway. Um, so we're going to have to figure out how can we provide seed funding, I mean, um, follow-on funding for these companies. So those are, you know, questions that we get to ask now because Act 221 existed. And because Act 221 existed, we have companies who now need follow-on funding. So I don't think we have to sort of talk about whether it was successful, it wasn't. I think we can just talk about what else do we need and how are we going to accomplish it in this budget, tight budget uh, situation. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that um, are, you, are you satisfied with you know the development of the industry uh, relative to what it might have been say after 221 was first adopted was what 2000 or 2001 in there somewhere um, I mean c could we have done retrospectively could we have done better could we have a more robust capital intensive uh, you know more successful industry today I think hindsight is 2020. Yeah. Um, I think this is exactly the opportunity we have to learn from that. Like, would we have done anything different? You know, had mm -hmm. we known that this is going to happen? Um, one of the things it, that's regrettable, of course, is that whether people liked it or not, if they committed to 10 years, they needed to commit to 10 years. Um, of course, we didn't foresee this budget crisis, uh, which affected uh, the support of it too. But I think. I don't think it was just that. I think before Act 221 was greatly criticized, um, and that's why it was amended as Act 215. So even then, I think that sent a message to say perhaps the lawmakers are not supportive of this um, after all. So I think that did shake the confidence of p potential investors, um, of tech people. Um, but of course, the strong tech companies are going to continue no matter what. Um, it just made them harder. Maybe some opportunities got lost. Um, one thing that nobody is openly speaking about yet is sort of the relationship, how important, important a role universities and uh, higher education in general uh, plays in economic development. So I hope that that doesn't get lost just because we're too busy thinking about capital formation because technology transfer is extremely important. You will not see any tech communities now which uh, were able to flourish without a substantial amount of investment and um, knowledge capital within the university systems. Look at North Carolina, look at Georgia, look at Silicon Valley, name any, com any area, Boston, any area that has um, uh, has now become a tech mecca. They all have great universities and university systems. So we need to work on that um, and, and integrate them into the industry. You know, it's interesting that when, when we all started thinking about this in the 90s, uh, some people said and, and continue to say that uh, government and tech, you know, separation of tech and state, we <laughs> used to say, that we don't need government to, to build a tech industry. But the reality, and I'm sure you agree, in our experience these days leads us otherwise because the plain fact is that it's complicated. Technology is complicated. You have to know a lot. 
You have to be right up there at the cusp. Um, you need to do research. Research costs money. Development costs money. So without investment capital, without a nod from the government, without some government incentivization, mm -hmm. you can't do it. And, be, and people don't yet get that, but I think after a while they will. Right, and I think that incentivization comes in different formats, right? So in California, when um, did they have some funding? Yes, they did. But was it through specifically tax credit? No, but they did have some sort of investment mechanism from the state. Um, they did fund their educational system greatly. Um, they did spend money restructuring their uh, tech transfer type programs. Um, so those are all great things that they've done. Um, again, so it's not necessarily just one. I mean, we can't rely on one initiative, tax initiative, legislative right. initiative, um, that's going to help the whole, whole spectrum of, of the tech needs. As you said, tech requires a lot of different aspects. And I think it is a government role. I mean, we expect government to build roads that's basic infrastructure. For technology, the basic road is making sure that we, are, we all have broadband access now. You know, so to me, maybe it doesn't look like a road, but it is equivalent to a road. You know, do we have buildings that are well wired? Do we have buildings that would have wet lab space for uh, scientists to do experiments? Or do they, I mean, if they have to build their own building, the chances are they're not gonna do it. So uh, those are all infrastructure, basic government role that's been identified before for other industries. So airports for tourism, for commerce, that's government's role. So I don't, I don't really see the difference between government support for tech versus tourism versus agriculture versus anything else. You know, I'll, I'll share with you uh, what I plan to write about in my next column because <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about it. And that is, uh, there was an article recently in the newspaper about, about First Wind and the wind project in Oahu, which will be a first because they've had difficulties, uh, the Hawaiian Electric has had difficulties in getting permits and the like to do wind in Oahu. But First Wind is a very sophisticated organization out of Newton, Massachusetts, and they're going to do some wind here. And uh, they, can buy, they can buy windmills from a place in California and, mm -hmm. and put them here, and they can find the investment capital. And they know how to get permits from the necessary government agencies. They know how to mollify those who might oppose these projects, and they're going to do it. At the end of the day, they're going to be billing uh, Hawaiian Electric for a lot of money for that, for that uh, alternative uh, energy. And that money is going to go to the mainland. Okay? And it just strikes me mm. that if we had some capital here from some, for some entrepreneurs here, they could buy the windmills. They could get the permits. They could deal with the, those who might oppose, and they could do the project, and then those checks will go to a local address. Yes. Why don't we do that? With the, <laughs> the tax revenues coming to the state. Right, exactly. absolutely. Yeah, that's, I mean, we're already giving away, what is it now, $7 billion yes. um, to the oil industry, which is not, it's, most of it is foreign, so we're not even contributing to the American economy. Yes. So. Yeah, so if there's any, anything we can do, that, that ought to be the first thing we do so that we ac at least capture the intellectual property and the tax revenues within the state to, to fix the schools that we desperately need to do. There's a huge role for HTDC going forward, I think. And maybe, you know, the whole energy thing uh, together with the people in DBAD who do energy, you know, can be sort of folded into this notion of, uh, incentivizing investment capital, incentivizing entrepreneurs to feel confident, you know, no inferiority complex to That's do large projects and <laughs> yes. all that, you know. <laughs> yes, I think um, we all need to play a part in that. I think um, when I was interviewed for the HDDC job, I was asked by one of the, the committee members, um, what is wrong with Hawaii? And I thought about it and I said, you know, my answer would be that that we have a self-esteem issue. And I, I think it's true, um, now having been in this job, there's plenty of great entrepreneurs here. There's plenty of um, ideas and companies that are just as good as the ones I know that are funded in the Silicon Valley. So, so what are we waiting for? We just need to do it. So sometimes incentivizing 
Um, and I would challenge the member members of the legislature and the members of the community to think what it means for us to incentivize certain action. Because sometimes it's not a little carrot stick that you hold out, say, here, come and get it. You get this thing extra. Incentivizing could sometimes mean we'll just pave the road for you so you, you won't get all dusty when you go on it. You know, or I will remove this big rock in front of you so you don't have to bulldozer it and it's not so hard and it doesn't take too long. So I think that's also important. Um, not only do we provide the capital, but we have to make it easy for people to do business here. We are still known as difficult to deal with. Um, I think we have... Well, after Super Ferry, <laughs> that'll, be t that'll take a while to work on. Right, so we have these examples and so the external community would tell us we're hard to deal with and that does something to our self-esteem. And we think, oh, if this is the kind of community we live in, surely nothing that comes out of this community can be as good as what's from the mainland and that's absolutely not true. There's plenty of people who get hired by mainland um, contractors, main contractors, as subcontractors to, to work on extremely important and high profile projects. We just don't hear about it and I think that's one of the things that we could do different from um, PR standpoint that we could work together get those success stories out and and believe it you know and, and I think we have to believe in ourselves to be able to go to the next step take the risk and embrace both the success and the failures and I think that's one of the hard things to do here failure is seen as you know just this big disappointment um, and it's a static state, like once you fail, then you're no good. When in Silicon Valley, uh, if you say you failed, um, then people are like, okay, at least you took enough risk, right? So if you haven't failed, then they're looking at you like, what's wrong with you? You haven't <laughs> taken enough <laughs> risk. So um, the important thing is that we learn from any failures that we have and any successes that we have um, from others. And so I'm looking forward to a more cohesive industry. I think a lot of people, the panelists at the Rebuild 2010 mentioned that we need to come up with the one and um, I like the concept of the one being not only the tech industry but the one being Hawaii because I think we're a small community and we need to take advantage of that. You know, we could be the one and, and work on these complex issues together and that, couldn't, that can't be as hard as we're making it out to be. You know, sometimes, it seems to me, it doesn't require bundles of money. Sometimes it's, it's going back to that um, encouragement thing where Absolutely. you say, uh, it's okay if you fail, where you say, uh, we love you, you're, you're our youth, you know, you're our future, we're, gonna, we're like, you know, your family, we're going to back you up no matter what happens because we want you to have a good life, that kind of thing. Sure. And, and you know, I also believe in faces. What I mean is, I believe that people have to have icons. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership is icons. It's presenting icons that speak multiple messages, you know, and one, and you have to have a face to do that. Mm -hmm. It can't be anonymous. And so you're a kind of a face, actually, Yuka. And when, when that uh, entrepreneur, you know, goes to the next step, takes that risk that may bring his company down, he needs to hear from a face like yours that says it's okay. We know how hard this is, you know, we know uh, what risk taking is like and we want you to take the risk. We want you to go ahead and, and that right. will encourage him, you know. Right. <laughs> him or her. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I don't know about the face, but uh, me being the face, but I think we are, hap we are very blessed, I think, to have a lot of faces and a um, lot of support. and. We are a small community of very diverse, and I think that's also very rare. And, um, and rather than take that as a uh, punishment, because obviously when you have a, such a diverse community of tech people, it is hard to make a critical mass. But hopefully we can celebrate in that diversity and make something of it that other community has not have been able to do, because they don't have that kind of diversity within that small community. So. Um, I think what we need to do is just like what entrepreneur would do for their own company um, is to find out what's unique or different about Hawaii and celebrate it. You know, wear it as a badge and not be embarrassed 
that, oh, we're Hawaii, we're geographically remote, we're this, we're that, um, energy costs are high, you know, we don't have warehouse space, land is expensive. I mean, we can give the list of reasons why we're not a typical uh, destination for, you know, for business attraction to be popular. Um, so rather than looking at the glass half empty, just can we agree that the glasses needs to be filled and what do we need to fill it with and, and who's going to do that and who's going to champion that um, and if that's more faces we need to get out in the open, so be it, um, message of hope. Um, and I think, I think the best message is that, you know, some of us have actually done it ourselves. I think that's a good message. Um, we need more entrepreneurs to step up, which I think uh, many have. Hank Rogers, for example, not only had a successful company, but he gave birth to three more, and um, he's set up the foundation to address the energy needs, and that's a very unselfish act um, and, and something for the community to, to gather around. So that's, those are all good things, and we can all learn from that. Yeah, well, I think... Um you touched on something a couple of times here about self-esteem and self-image, and um, I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I think that we, we're still finding that, you know. We've had a little trouble finding it. I mean, not just in the, in the last administration, but over time, maybe even since sure. uh, statehood, we've had trouble finding exactly what we want to do right. when we grow up. <laughs> you know, and, and if we all could settle on that, sort of the way Singapore has settled on that, right. and we all, we all uh, you know, found a measure of excellence uh, and uh, decided that we were going right. to be world famous for something, um, then we, we could march together, perhaps. Sure. Uh, I would say, you know, I was watching some of the documentary footage for uh, the statehood, um, and I realized that that was probably one time where we were very organized as a community and there was an external sort of a threat. Um, it wasn't terrorism, it wasn't whatever, but the fact that we were not, we were just a territory that posed all kinds of sort of second class citizen labels and we were not part of this economic development uh, from the federal assistance and, um, and you know, the unions or whomever got together to, to organize ourselves, put key people in key positions, and we got it done. And maybe we still had low self-esteem back then, I don't know, but um, we were able to manage to get it done. So maybe it's not so important that we have to get over this low self-image. Maybe we should just accept it that this is who we are, but that doesn't mean we have to be paralyzed. And again, this is the perfect storm. Right. So right government has the right size. We have to have the right priorities. Businesses too. This is survival of the fittest. Okay, so let's get to it. Let's you know buckle down and get some work done. And um, this is the time where we have to invest because the Googles of tomorrow, the seeds will be planted today. And if we don't plant anything now, then we will for sure be the losers in the next decade. Yeah. So that's an important point. We shouldn't just be thinking about trying to keep our heads above water right now. Well, I, as I recall, uh, Linda Lingle was talking about being impatient for progress. You know, mm. we, we should not be patient to wait. We can't wait now. And that's, uh, that's where I, I want to talk about uh, at a point where you and I apparently disagree. Okay. We were both written up in an article by uh, Beverly Kramer oh, about right. Kaka Aka. Yes. And uh, she started by my, my comments with, um, you know, uh, referring to the tumbleweed in the streets, the tumbleweed on Ilalo Street, <laughs> because nothing had happened there in all this time. You know, you only have the medical school, that's it. Mm -hmm. All the other projects have blown away somewhere, uh, which affect you. We'll talk about that. Sure. And, uh, you know, I was being very impatient in my comments, but you were quoted to saying, these things take a while. It, it takes does. 30 years, you said. It does. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. Um, I was very careful to mention to, and, and a lot of, the interview was like an hour and a half long. And so just a bit that got quoted uh, may be misleading. That's not to say that 30 years from now it would be a success because we didn't do the right thing in the first couple of years. 
right? So I think there's plenty of blame to go around there. I think there were definitely sort of super fairy moments um, in that whole project where I guess I understand there's a litigation going on with UH development and a uh, couple of things that didn't pan through. Um, oh, the Cancer Research Center you talked with about. With the right? Cancer Research Center and then there's the um, RBL um, issue which I haven't figured out if they settled on it or if they're going through with it. Um, so they're definitely indecision that shouldn't exist. You know, again, you commit and you go with it or, Focus. or don't don't start, don't make these overtures that you want to do it, dangle your feet. That's, that just creates a lot of work for a lot of people and, and not get far. And there are lots of things I don't understand about university uh, internal um, bureaucracies, for lack of a better word, and procedures. So I didn't want to comment on those. So I don't know what kind of decisions got made or didn't get made because of what, but I can tell you that even if all the things lined up, I don't think you can expect the life sciences industry within 10 years. I would not disagree with that. Like the way things are now, you know, there is virtually no momentum. And you have to have momentum Absolutely. in order to, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm sure there's an arithmetic formula out there that shows you how fast you can go. But right now, uh, there's been too much, too much nothing. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, and that's, that's sad. And I think, you know, I don't know if it's, uh, to me, everything comes down to leadership and the priorities of that leader. Um, and for a leader to be successful in that type of venture, you have to bring in both the industry, you know, the hospitals need to be supportive. They've got, um, dip, you know, different departments and schools, medical school, um, federal agencies, uh, NSF and so forth, um, NIH, um, legislature, everybody working together. And that requires a lot of resource, time, passion, um, and perhaps, like you said, we need a face. And perhaps with the new president of UH, we will have that support. Um, Hope so. You know, you like to see the uni university come sort of downtown. You like to see them, you know, exchanging ideas and people and, and projects and collaborating. And that really hasn't happened in, uh, in Kaka'ako, yeah, regrettably. It's, unfortunate. It's, their, it's their bailiwick because it's their land under HCDA. Um, but they have single-handedly <laughs> failed to, to complete any project. In fact, every project aside the medical school itself, which was mm -hmm. a, a function of Edwin C. Cadman, um, you know, has sort of been dead on arrival. It's really too bad. But that affects you. Because you were going to, you, you have this issue with Manoa. Yes. And you were going, you tried so many times to get down to Kaka'ako. Tell me how that went and what is it like now? So to, I guess, provide background for the user, uh, the viewers, um, Manoa Innovation Center is sort of our flagship in incubation center in, in Hawaii, in Oahu, on Oahu. Um, and that's where HCDC is headquartered and we incubate companies and we also house a couple of uh, UH programs um, and we were and the land belongs to UH although the state legislature provided funds to HCDC to build the building and that lease expires in 2015 so that's right around the corner when you think about how long it takes for state legislature to be able to allocate land and and provide funds for new buildings. Um, and we have been urging the University of Hawaii to extend that lease to HCDC because our work is not done there. And clearly, if they have um, external pressures to do more economic development, more reach to the industry, and for tech transfer to continue to emphasize not just on IP creation, but on commercializing that intellectual property, then surely HDDC has a role at Mano Innovation Center. So we've been asking the legislature to support it. Uh, last legislative session, um, we did. We were able to pass um, a Senate concurring resolution um, that stated that 
the legislature urges the University of Hawaii to extend that lease. And of course, at that hearing, Good. University of Hawaii objected to, to that resolution. Truly sorry to hear um, that. And the reasons were, uh, well, they mentioned that the, one of the reasons was because they needed it for administrative offices. And I understand that the previous president wanted it to be, uh, to house his office um, there. So I thought that was maybe not the best alignment, not the best use for the facility because the tax laws have changed since the Mano Innovation Center was established. So to avoid some you know, technical details, I'll just summarize by saying that if we were to build a facility for commercial use, because this is what, that is what it is for incubation centers, I have to have commercial tenants coming in. For us to be able to do that, the tax law have changed where it is prohibitive and more expensive for us to do so. So it's cheaper for us to keep that building and have University of Hawaii build a new building elsewhere uh, for administrative or lab or whatever purposes. But if it's for educational purposes, they can build the building cheaper than, than we can. So why not work out the economics? Um, that's, I'm just being very pragmatic. Oh, sure. Um, so we will have plan A and plan B. Plan A is hopefully we can stay. Uh, plan B is to have an alternative location and we will move as soon as a pro proper location is provided and that we can move in. Now, of course, the incubation center is, could be expanded so we could continue to help out in Mano Innovation Center to not only have commercialization going but have those professors be able to create companies based on their um, discoveries and produce, you know, contribute to the economy that way and assist in that process. So we could do that and have a separate incubation center for the rest of the community. So we'll see. There was something in the paper uh, only this morning about how a building or two um, at Manoa campus had been uh, declared unusable and then um, they had to move, um, you know, the offices uh, out of those buildings and put them somewhere else outside the campus. It seems to me that this all could be resolved. I mean, that issue plus the Minot Innovation Center issue could be resolved if the university went on an appropriate building plan or a plan where buildings were not being condemned mm. um, right, right, right at home, right in Manoa campus. So they wouldn't need or believe they need your space or other space outside the campus. Right. So there, there seems to be a need for proper inventorying. For example, uh, there are a lot of departments that, that have downsized and yet their um, square footage is not. And all you see is that it looks occupied because there's lots of journals stacked and you know lab equipment stacked or what whatnot. Um, but I think. Um, you know, we're all in this together. If we could all be mindful of the resources, I think we can work it out. So again, I'm sort of hoping to appeal to the pragmatist in all of us or just being reasonable, um, again, for betterment of the entire community. Well, over time, it's become clear that the Manoa Innovation Center is really a special place. It's an icon. It's uh, a lot of very successful companies have grown grown up and right. were born there and grew up there and then went out to do phenomenal things. And so it has a history of success and uh, it, it becomes very important, I think, in the state technology picture. And I, uh, I don't think you could give it up without a tremendous loss. And right now you don't have an option. Uh, you know, it's right. that place or no place. That's know? right. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's a good point, I think. Um, and maybe the viewers are not aware, but um, tech companies grow at very different rates and have very different needs than non-tech companies. So entrepreneurs start off with, and they want to start off with the smallest square footage possible. And many of the commercial spaces don't have that kind of small um, rooms and they don't have flexible leasing. So you sign up for a three-year lease, a five-year lease, and you're locked into that space. If you need to switch buildings because that space is no longer acceptable to you, then you have to figure out what to do, whether you can sublease it or take a loss on that space. I mean, it's, it's something that an entrepreneur doesn't have the time for. So for us, it's not just a 
below market or good rate rent. It's also the flexible lease terms and being able to be with other entrepreneurs. So uh, when they go out to lunch, they bump into each other and they exchange a few ideas. And like you said, if so they were all having the same problems, we have sort of comrades to uh, share war stories and figure out what you did and, oh, okay, I'm going to look into that or thanks for that referral. <laughs> and those are when, you know, good ideas come by and problems get solved and I would hate to, and it's hard to monetize that kind of, you know, not to sound like some credit card commercial, but it's priceless. And I like to be able to preserve that for the entrepreneurs here in, in the community. You remind me of uh, Robert Olson, who was the guy who developed the new Fitzsimmons Biotech Center just uh, right near uh, uh, Denver. And um, it was a phenomenal job he did. So I asked him one day on the radio show, if you, if you will, um, what was the secret? What, what brought these companies and researchers, world-class researchers, to do, to do their research in his mm -hmm. facility? And he said it was very simple. It was breakfast. And that means sure. they got together, and he created an environment where they could get together and had breakfast. And the breakfast, of course, was, they would talk to each other, and it, they would expose their work, and they would find out about the other guy's work. And over time, uh, this became very important to them because sure. research is the most important thing in their lives is the research. <laughs> so that's why, I mean, I totally agree with you. That's why Manoa Innovation Center is a critical mass kind of um, Right. Uh, facility and we can't we can't lose it and we have to make it make it the critical mass facility it should be so question is you, you made some reference to the fact that it could be bigger and that maybe Absolutely. you need more space and at one sure. time there was more space here there was a there was a, a place downtown for health uh, health science research went out of business at Kapiolani uh, Hawaii Pacific Health something mm, okay. and it was down in Amfac years ago and, and they tried to make it work didn't work and so the, you know, it's always a question as to whether we could do that again, whether we should sure. do that, and whether you should do that again. I think the reason, well, I don't know the specifics of this case, um, I can let you know that incubation centers are extremely tough to run because, again, unlike a commercial real estate agent that could just sign up a company and have them paying for six years at a time or whatever, um, it's not like that where they're constantly changing the needs. We're constantly shuffling people from one suite to another. That's a lot of overhead and you don't make money at it. So um, I've heard of lots of incubation centers run commercially go out of business for specifically because it's just too much work for the amount of money that they get. Um, also, you're looking at more risky uh, companies in terms of financial credit, um, we're also looking at small potatoes, lots of small potatoes, rather than one big entity whom, you know, who could take a lot of square footage and just be able to send one bill. So there are lots of uh, needs that they have that's harder for any commercial businesses to be able to make money at. So um, that's, again, the reason why incubation centers um, seems like a role for government, you know, because we can take the risk and we can manage it and we could have the land be, you know, leased free or very low cost to an agency for us to be able to do that so that just the uh, um, revenues coming in from the rent could be used for programs and for operations. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, uh, it's good and bad. I mean, uh, for, for you to do it because you more than a, um, a, a commercial operation would understand how to do it. You know, you have a lot of experience in that. but. On the other hand, for you to raise the money, build the building, get all the people who have to agree to agree, and put the passion in them, you know, about the necessity of the project, that's difficult. I hope you can do it. Well, our agency has done it twice before, so hopefully we'll be able to do that again. So we were able to build Manoa from scratch, Manoa Innovation Center, and we were also the first building to be established in the Manoa Tech Park so that we could be the anchor tenant for the park itself. And I would say that sort of experiment has succeeded. Now there are three other buildings there um, that are privately held and, um, and vibrant. So, you know, I think, I think there is a move to take a look at Oahu having a tech park and I should hope that any tech park anywhere would have an incubation component to it. 
Yeah, you know, I was I was going to ask you about that. I mean, going back to the the question of the face and the icon, which somehow rallies people, gives them gives mm -hmm. them something to follow. It's leadership of of a sort. Uh, if we had a brick and mortar commercial tech park out there, such as the what was it, the Mililani Tech Park years ago? Uh, that wasn't really a tech park, by the way. It was an industrial industrial park. park with, yeah. And I think they were marketing it, you know. Yes. It was tech, but it, well, you're right. But if we had that, uh, such as in China, you know, how many fabulous tech parks there are? And they build them on spec. You can see through the buildings. There's nobody home for years. And all right. of a sudden, bang, it's full up. And they're going great guns. And that's how you build a tech industry. You have confidence in people. So hmm, what is the prospect of having a, a tech park here? I mean, a real tech park. Well, we're all looking at it, the stakeholders. And I think we all realize that, you know, we could have these tech companies all you know, going at different, uh, coming in in different warehouse districts or um, co-locating with financial district people, like having offices in Bishop Street. Um, or they could feel like they have their own part of the city, um, where that could be sort of the tech mecca of Honolulu or of Oahu. And that's believing in tech. You know, that's that's a boost to the self-confidence if there was one. Is, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so, and then again, the synergy and all of that. So we are looking at that. And it's not just for looks or morale. I think there's a definite need. You know, people who have, say, uh, people who are doing um, algae or some sort of biofuel type um, work, a normal Bishop Street building isn't going to want a tenant who's going to be running around with beakers full of some slick material inside which may spill Green, and much less. that's right <laughs> and you know and a biohazard possibly and so what are they going to do they don't have a place to go right now so again this is sort of like having a road it's government's role like let's see if we can build something um, so that, that will be our next step, is to make sure that there's enough infrastructure to capture the creativity of these companies and make sure that if they don't want to, they don't have to go to the mainland. Should we give up on Kaka'ako? You know, you were going to be housed there. You were going to have a, a good part of the, the, the KS building that we're going to build. And I, I'm not sure the status of that right now, whether you still have expectations, but uh, I can see the tumbleweed on Ilalo Street. <laughs> and I wonder if you do have expectations, whether you think that's going to be the answer to the problem we're talking about. Um, for our agency, no, it cannot be. And the reason is because unless we are given free rent, we can't make the um, numbers work. So um, I think the rent was extremely high for any state agency, but of course, if we have to underwrite any sort of um, companies, liabilities, and uh, for when they vacate and there are three months where the space is vacant and we have to pay the rent, well, there's not enough money in the state budget for us to be able to do that. So that's an issue. So if you are going to have an incubator, not just a commercial tech space, but an incubator, then it's going to have to be where the land is pretty much free or um, given to you at low, really low cost. Isn't there a lot of free land in Kalailoa? So, um, I think p different people are looking at different properties and I think they have different technical issues associated with it. And I, I do believe in at some point, you know, build it, they will come, but then there's also build it, they won't come because it's not the right space. So you build something on North Shore, are people going to commute an hour to get there? I don't think so. Mm. Um, dual use companies are needing access to Pearl Harbor or you know, um, other defense contractors close to that area. Um, of course, the executives of high-tech companies, they're living in Kahala, Hawaii Kai. They're not necessarily willing to travel to Mililani, even though their workers may be from Mililani. Um, so there's cultural issues to contend with, and so we got to work out all those little issues and um, and make sure that it's going to be successful. Part of the part of that has to be uh, what what you talked about before, what we talked about last Thursday, namely uh, public relations, getting the word out. Because I, I think if um, the word was out on a tech park, a location, a tech park, and some anchors would come around, mainland anchors, you know, people talked about. Um, having the governor call Merck or some big 
pharma company on the mainland every morning and try to get one to come out here, that would kind of solve the problem. If some big tech company would come out here, it would mm -hmm. be the anchor. But if you did public relations and you, you brought people in that way, uh, then the rest would follow. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you, if you prevailed on people and made them understand that the tech industry was the salvation of the state, which I personally, I think you too, believe is the case, um, you know, then, then it would all fall into place. Right. And so it's a matter of getting the word out. So my question to you is, whose responsibility is it to get the word out? And I, and I am not suggesting that it should be or could be or would properly be government. But whose responsibility is it? I think we all are. Don't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we should all have a stake in that. It's, it's our future. I mean, are you going to be part of the solution or part of the problem? So are we going to do something about it or are we just going to talk about it, right? So I'll do my part and I hope everybody else will too. And I think that the part about it is not just PR because business attraction is extremely hard for a, a state that has one of the highest electricity rate in the nation and um, cost of living is high. So I'm trying to get NASA to do more experiments in Hawaii, but uh, similar experiments can be done in Caribbean, Caribbean areas at a lower cost. They're going to deploy there instead. So we are going to be sort of out that opportunity for us to be interacting more, um, having NASA equipment um, that they could share with other um, agencies, possibly University of Hawaii. You know, we have lots of connections with um, observatories and UH astronomy, you know, so those are in Soast. I mean, those are world-class programs that we have here right in UH, um, and we're missing the boat. So we're going to have to do something about that, and that's where I think we can incentivize, not just for individual companies, but what can we do to make it easier? So if, if, if we're going to solve anything, you know, I, I would say two things. One is Let's fix our education system so, you know, kids get the education that they deserve so that we could, you know, have them as part of our workforce in the future. And secondly, let's see if we could control our energy costs through hopefully renewable and sustainable energy source so that business attraction will be easier, among other good things that will happen if we could get that done. So I think. I think there are some moving pieces, but obviously some take more priority than others, and um, I think energy is one of them. I, I, as, you were, as you were making that discussion, I kept thinking of a website that's sticky. You know, you come to the website and you can't put it down, you can't leave it. It's not just that you got there, it's not just that's that right. somebody got you to come, but that once there, it's engaging with you, it's bonding right. up with you, and, and, and I think from what you say, we've got to do more than just get them there. We've got to keep them there. Right. <laughs> so first, it's tough enough for us to invite them here. And once they're there, and you know those some of those folks, they have left for a multitude of reasons. And um, I would hope that if they really thought that Hawaii had everything that they needed, that they didn't have to leave. So um, it's setting up the right expectations and being able to deliver on what we said we would give them. You know, um, again, Super Ferry come to mind. Uh, lots of other um, smaller companies come to mind. Ventures come to mind. But I think we gotta. I think that's just being honest and professional. Under promise, over deliver. Yeah, and it's the follow up. The follow up call right. that says, "Well, now that we got you here, are you happy today? Is there anything we can do for you today?" Right. <laughs> and we don't have to give away the shop, which I think. No. No. Again, the self-esteem thing, you know, we, we feel like we have to promise the moon to get people to come here. Well, I think we have to be reasonable in those offers as well, you know, so that we don't feel ripped off at the end of the day. And consistent. Mm -hmm. So that it isn't just a political play. It's, we, you know, this is the way we do it. We always do it the same way. We think it's pretty good. Why don't you try it out? Right. Um, so what about, what would you say, though, to the activists? Because, you know, there are, there are anti-tech people, anti-progress people in the state. Mm. Sometimes they have a very loud voice referring again to the super ferry. It's not the only thing, though. There's lots of things. So what would you say to them? Because when they go on their activist campaigns, they have an effect on all of this process sure. we're talking about. What's the message to them? Again, I don't think that's as polar as we make it out to be. 
Um, I think, and I don't know who those activists you're referring to say There's they're nobody here in the studio, uh, I, <laughs> environmental <laughs> um, protection agencies. Um, I'm with them, but I feel like um, technology is going to be part of the solution, right? So we want clean water. We don't want to burden the environment. Technology is, is the solution to some of those, you know, wastewater treatment, low impact, this, that, you know, and renewable energy. So again, uh, you know, Super Ferry was a, an extremely politicized um, situation. I do believe environmental study should be done, but that's, and again, I, I do believe that environmental spec should be based on science, not on some bureaucratic uh, mumbo jumbo that doesn't apply anymore. It, it needs to be, um, permits need to be science-based, up-to-date, um, and really protecting, because some of the, I understand, um, that some of the permitting requirements don't necessarily protect our environment. They just just happen to be something we came up with and it's no longer uh, or it's outdated um, based on new scientific knowledge. So we need to update those things so that we really are protecting our environment because really that's what we've got um, in this island state. Um, so I'm, I'm not really feeling like, I guess there's going to be anti-progress people um, but it's nostalgia, you know, we want it to be the way it was. Sure, sure. And sometimes we have to change to keep things the way it is. Uh, yeah. And so we got to figure out what's important to us. Yeah. You know, if it's the culture, sort of being able to care for our ohana um, and have this community and that's important, then maybe we should look at creating more jobs that pay better and um, that people can feel proud about and not have to leave the community because that's what keeps Ohana, right? So if that means embracing some technology jobs, so be it. But if you have to keep doing this one, you know, I don't know. I don't know how many jobs you have to keep to, you know, for, uh, I know that tech jobs pay on average much better uh, than the average job, um, average non-tech jobs. So. You know, if you can reduce your number of overtime, then you have more time with your family. Is not getting back to the old ways. So I would pose that challenge. It's true. And if you're running the treadmill of three low-paid jobs and you can't spend time with your kids, you can't spend time at home, and your kid, you lose your kids effectively, and they lose the possibility of good education, your family is going nuclear on you, um, that's not a good situation. It's better to have a high-paid job. Absolutely true. Yeah, so that's what I would say. Well, I think you covered a lot of the points I was going to ask in my final question, but I'll, I'll ask it and see what's left, okay? <clears throat> Your wish list. You, individually, as a te technology person, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who's been around the block, you, as a member of the government, you, as the CEO of the High Tech Development Corporation, for enough years to know the real deal going on. <laughs> What's your wish list, Yuka? Well, that's a lot of hats um, that I have to represent. Um, I know education will be top on my list um, in economic development, but also as a citizen and part of being part of government. I, I cannot feel proud of who I represent or who I am or where I'm from if I'm going to be known as oh, you're from that state that has the least number of instructional days, <laughs> or um, that half the science teachers fail the qualification for teaching that subject. Um, I think we deserve better. I think our kids deserve better. And I don't even have kids. So, <laughs> so I think it makes me sad um, because I think that's a value judgment that whether it's a decision that we are explicitly making or it's uh, some sort of indecision that becomes a decision, it doesn't matter. I think we let this happen and I think, I hope that we can start healing by um, reprioritizing what's important and what we're willing to, to give up for it. Um, I'd be willing to give up a lot for our kids to be educated better and and creating an atmosphere where parents have time to be able to 
take part in that education process because education isn't just schooling that we all have to put into it. And um, so I think that's a very lofty um, goal and it's not sexy and I think that's why people aren't really, and it's a very difficult problem to, to fix. It's political, it's budgetary, it's emotional. Um, we're dealing with structure that's, you can't just put a band-aid on it. Um, and it perpetuates, the problem perpetuates itself in future generations. Sure. Mm -hmm. So somebody has to be brave enough and I think it starts with all of us to say, okay, I'm not going to stand for this anymore and let's not just complain about it, but you know, what are the solutions and what do we want, why do we want it, how are we going to get there. Um, without education, it doesn't matter what great tech community we create because it's not going to last, it's not going to be sustainable. So I hope my my vocation isn't um, made obsolete because we don't have enough people to feed into our tech community that we, you know, we nurture. That'll be my, my one wish. Just one. Just one. <laughs> Everything else will follow. I guarantee it. Yeah, that's focus. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Yuka. It's Thanks, great Jay. to talk to you. We're not finished. There's much more. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Aloha. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.